You know how many minutes there are in a day? 1,440. Do you know how many hours there are in a week? 168. It's interesting to me that rich people cannot buy more hours. Scientists cannot invent new minutes. You cannot even save time to spend it on another day. You've got a little time today. You say, well, I'd like to save it up for tomorrow. You can't do that. Do you number your days? Do you realize how important every single day is? It all comes down to this moment for Super Bowl 42. That day, we were the underdogs. It was a game many thought was over before we even played. Unless the Giants can come back here, the undefeated Patriots are poised to make Super Bowl history. I knew I was open, but I wouldn't be open for long. Direct snap to Manny. Back to throw. The rush. As I look back, it was easy to see Eli was under duress. It's gonna be hit. It's gonna be sacked. No, no, he got out of it. Unbelievable. I remember the first moment when I became completely blown away and intrigued with the idea of being a magician. That was the moment that I knew that I could actually be good at this. It is the most fun thing in the world to me. I tend to like questions a lot more than answers. And what a magic trick does is it forces you into a place of questioning and it pulls the rug of reality out from underneath you to where you're literally left in a place where you don't know what is happening. I was 14 and I recorded my first song. My mom actually helped me to record it. She had some recording gear and it was the most amazing thing to hear yourself recorded. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would be a musician for a living. I didn't even think that was possible. As a magician, you're very skeptical and you realize that most of what's going on behind the scenes is fake or false. The idea of an all-powerful God seems incredibly silly. And when I talk to people that would go to church, I can remember thinking that they were just falling for a simple magic trick. It's like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain controlling everything. I'd grown up understanding how to make people believe something was real when it was really not. I am a master of phoniness. I'm a, I'm a charlatan by craft. But I began to ask myself the big God question. I said, God, if you are real, then I need you to bring me back behind the curtain. I need you to show me how it works. And I need you to make this so real to me that I cannot ignore it. never forget the day this man walks into my room and he said, Mr. Monroe, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have, you have cancer. I said, what? And he looked at me and said, Mr. Monroe, he said, we cannot cure you of your disease. My wife and I were we were in a bad place. God 
where are you? I guess you aren't that great. I had been married for five years. I had just a three-year-old girl and a two-year-old little boy. And I needed, I needed more time with my family. I needed more time. Third down and five. Manny takes the snap. Pressure from the outside. He's looking downfield, but they are all over it. And he fires it off. Giants drafted me in the sixth round of the 2003 draft, and uh, it was it was everything that I was looking for. You know, I had some tremendous challenges uh, through college, getting on, getting the field, getting the recognition, and now I felt like you know th th this is finally it. So it was it was about that it was about that glory for me as as a rookie, and I, I just enjoyed every moment of it. You know, most people would like to think that, you know, money would solve all your problems. And I found that the money only multiplied the evils that were in my life. It just gave me access to more of the things that I craved the most. Whether, you know, if I had women, it just, you know, it just made me that much more likable by women. If I, I loved it, I loved alcohol. And now I was able to get all the alcohol I wanted. I loved, you know, now, whereas maybe in time past I didn't have marijuana, now I'm able to buy all the marijuana that I wanted. You know, I was one person in public and, and, a, and a totally different person in private. My struggles with alcohol were a lot more than just having a good time and getting wasted and laughing away. I was totally, you know, just inebriated to the point where I couldn't keep my composure. There were times where my blackouts, you know, led me to places where I woke up the next day and naked in a bed and not knowing you know, what happened the night before. You know, I smoked weed every single day throughout my rookie year, and I began to not just smoke the weed, I began to sell the weed. I'll never forget those sirens in my rearview mirror, the sound and, and how my heart dropped in that very moment. You know, being asked to get out that car and, uh, and them searching the car and pulling out that half a pound of marijuana. And uh, it was a deflating moment in my life. For the first time, you know, as I was being pulled into that Fort Lee jail cell, I realized that I was broken. You know, I was broken and there was no one to look at other than myself. On the outside, you look great. But deep inside, you're searching for something you haven't yet found. There must be something else in life than this. When I was a little girl, we kind of struggled financially. My mom being a single mom with two kids at 18, it was obviously, it was a difficult situation to be in. When I was 10 years old, my cousin, who was three, was like a little brother to me, he was beaten to death by his stepfather. How could I trust in a God that would allow something like that to happen? It just spiraled into depression, and I ended up hanging out with people who had issues like mine in their life and ended up getting involved in drugs and just continued to fuel that depression. When I was 16, I was a um, very outspoken atheist and really searched a lot of different religions and just felt so empty in everything, whether it was in drugs or sex or even just deep thinking and philosophies. It just seemed to all leave me really empty. And uh, since there wasn't anything in life that satisfied the emptiness, I just didn't want to do life anymore. There were times I cried myself to sleep at night. 
I made a plan to commit suicide. I just didn't want to wake up anymore. I just was tired of waking up, and I just thought, I can't keep doing this. Only to wake up wishing that I didn't. The day I planned to commit suicide, I came home from school early, and my grandma wasn't supposed to be home. And she just had a way of knowing, knowing when something was wrong. And she just looked at me and said, something's wrong with you. You're going to church. And that was the last place in the world I wanted to be. I hated Christians. I hated church. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to go to church. And we got into a crazy screaming match. And I just remember saying, if you'll just shut up, I'll go. And when it's over, then I'll commit suicide. Millions are crying, what can I do to be saved from the pressures of life? The pressures are just so great. We have great technology to save time, but we have less time than ever. The tensions in the home, problems at work, health problems, making ends meet. We want to scream at life. We want to escape from life. Adlai Stevenson once said, it's not the days of your life, but the life in your days that count. You have so much time, but for what? The things that are broken in your heart and life can be restored in Christ if you put your faith and your confidence in Him. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead for you. He wants to give you guidance in your life. He wants to give you a peace and joy and assurance that if you died, you'd go to heaven. But first, there must be a change. You must turn around. That's called repentance in the Bible. Repent. When I was in that jail cell, I really just knew I was at the end of my own strength. I realized I'm 24 years old, NFL Special Teams Rookie of the Year, New York Giants Rookie of the Year, and I got everything that anybody could potentially want, but it didn't lead to anything apart from decay and death and disappointment. And I was broken. You know, I was broken and, you know, and I realized that, you know what, there was no one to look at other than myself. And at that moment, nothing else mattered. I just knew I needed something more. I just cried out in desperation and just said, God, all I know is I need you. And that following weekend, after I got arrested, I ended up in the back of a church in a fetal position, crying and weeping out to God. I could no longer resist God's love. As I received God's forgiveness, I knew that I was, I was new. The person of Jesus Christ was now a reality in my life. It wasn't just a myth. It wasn't just a figment or this, this idea. The forgiveness of sins is what actually sets man free. And I was immediately transformed. I knew that I experienced a, a love that, would, that had changed my life forever. And I knew there was never going to be any looking back for me. is collapsing on us. How much longer do we have? The psalmist requested that the Lord remember how short my time is. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I'm withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Think of it. God will endure forever. But on this earth, we're like a shadow. It's declining. We're all dying. From the moment you were born, you started dying. How much longer do we have? The cancer doctor looked at me and said, Mr. Monroe, he said, we cannot cure you of your disease. There is something, however, that we would like to try. It's called a bone marrow transplant. The problem with your body is that your white blood cells are making bad copies of bad copies. Your body is deceiving itself. 
it's playing a trick on itself. So what we need to do is we need to completely destroy your system. And what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to find someone in the world whose DNA matches yours close enough to grow a brand new immune system, a brand new blood system from scratch. We're gonna substitute someone else's perfect blood on your behalf so that you can live again. God said without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There has to be a substitute for you who will take the judgment that you deserve, the death that you deserve, and that substitute became Jesus Christ. I was thinking to myself, man, my time is running out. I am dying of cancer. It's been hard to deal with right now. Peyton is three years old and Gavin is two years old. My two babies, should this take my life early, I love you. They began the most vicious concoction of chemo, the goal of which was not just to destroy the cancer in my body, but was literally to destroy me. It was hell. It was a slow death. I really am scared. I'm really trying not to be fearful, but I am fearful. I'm trying to be strong for my wife and for my, for my family, but uh, I'm pretty scared. We are waiting to hear from the National Bone Marrow Donor Program, seven million people currently registered on the database. And there was one perfect match for me, just one. It was a 19-year-old female. They said, Mr. Monroe, your bone marrow transplant is scheduled for April 23rd. You're gonna get a brand new birthday. They said, you are gonna be like a baby inside the womb all over again. The nurses celebrate your new birth in the hospital. And I had heard that terminology before too, somewhere at the churches that I had attended. But literally, I was going to be born anew. And then I'll never forget, on April 23rd, they brought this bag of blood into my room, and everyone was hoping in that moment that my body would receive that new life, that new blood. I sit here today, 100% completely cancer-free, when they look at my blood today, they see a 19-year-old female. They see her, they see XX chromosome. And I'm reminded of a verse in Galatians 2 that says, uh, it's no longer I who live, but it's someone else who lives on the inside of me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith. Save my life. Oh, really? Yeah, that's awesome. Save my life, I almost died. John 17, three, it says, this is eternal life, knowing you, God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I'm fully convinced of the claims of Jesus as a skeptical person and as an illusionist. I know that the God of the universe has brought me back behind the curtain just like I asked him to, cancer, was how he did it through my life. And there's a spiritual cancer that's eating us away on the inside. And we're all longing, we're all begging for someone to step in and to save us from that condition. God looks at your heart and God sees that you have a spiritual heart disease. And that spiritual heart disease is called sin. And we're all sinners. That means we've broken the laws of God. We've disobeyed God. We've rebelled against God. And because we've rebelled against Him, we're going to have to face a judgment. Oh yes, there's coming a judgment. There'll be some day when you will stand before God at the great judgment day, and you'll have to give an account of your life here, and you'll have to give an account of what you did with Jesus Christ on this very night. Because there's going to be a judgment. But God's judgment 
is also tempered by his love and his mercy. He's willing to forgive you tonight. He's willing to give you a chance tonight. No matter how much time you've wasted in the past, you can still have tomorrow. I was sitting in the back of the church, slouched down in my chair with my arms crossed, and the preacher began to speak, and everything he said was straight to my heart, like I was the only person in the room. And he stops in the middle of what he's saying, and he says, there's a suicidal spirit in the room, and God wants you to know that he loves you. All the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I was like, this is just really freaking me out. I gotta get out of here. I got up and went towards the door after he dismissed the church, and a man grabbed me by the arm, and he was a white-headed old man, and he said, God wants me to speak to you, and he wants you to know that even though you've never known an earthly father, that he will be a better father to you than any earthly father could ever be. He said, he's seen you when you cry yourself to sleep at night. And when he said that, it really shook me because I cried myself to sleep every night since I was 10 years old. If I didn't cry, I couldn't sleep. But he said, he sees you when you cry yourself to sleep at night and he loves you so much. And he sent his son Jesus to die and bleed on a cross to take all of the pain that you're experiencing on himself so you don't have to experience it. He said, do you want him to take that from you because he died to take it? And I was like, well, you can try it. <laughs> you know, he was like, can I pray for you for that? And I was like, you can try it. I don't really believe in all this, but I know something crazy is happening right now. And so he put his hand on my shoulder and began to pray. And he said something like, God, I pray that you would wrap your arms around your daughter and let her know how much you love her. In my life, I searched for something to satisfy the longing in my heart. And every time I that moment, something you just can't explain that you have to experience, where I literally felt like I was in front of the God of the universe. And the thing that I noticed, first of all, was that this God was so holy and awesome, and I was so not that. Some of you think that you're too bad to come to God, have done too many things and gone too far. God's not waiting to judge you. God's not waiting to condemn you. God loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you, to shed his blood for you. He wants to put his arms around you and receive you, and he will take you and forgive you and love you and be your friend. This God was so holy and awesome. And if God had said, go away, it would have been right. It would have been justice for me. I know it. But the craziest thing was that he's drawing me in and taking me into his arms and saying, I love you just the way you are. I'm not shocked by any of this. And if you let me, I will make you new. I'm just so thankful that God sees us different than we are. He doesn't turn away, but he still looks at us with love. It's amazing to think that God is a father like that. Jesus died in my place. And because of that, all I have to do is believe it and say yes. 
change me. Yes, make me new. In Romans, the sixth chapter says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In 1 Peter, it says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. He became sin, think of it. Jesus Christ, this pure, this wonderful, the greatest person that ever lived, the holiest person that ever lived, the Son of the living God, became sin. He had never known sin, and he became guilty at that moment of adultery. He became guilty of lying, of idolatry. He became guilty of every ugly, dirty thing you can think of because it was your sins poured out on him. Through Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. You say, well, Billy, what in the world do I have to do? First, you must repent of your sins. The apostle Peter said, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins be blotted out. What does repentance mean? Repentance means that you come to God and say, God, I'm sorry I've sinned. And we're all guilty. Every one of us, everyone that's ever been born is guilty. Have you repented? Are you sure of it? It means that you not only say, God, I'm sorry. It means that you ask him to help you to turn from your sins, to change your way of living, to get rid of those old habits you shouldn't have. And then you must come by faith. By, without faith, it's impossible to please him. The word faith means that you totally trust. The scripture says in Romans 4, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. I have to have righteousness to get into heaven, and I don't have any. Billy Graham is a sinner. I don't have any righteousness of my own. I come in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you can work your way to heaven, you'd get up to heaven and boast to everybody. Look what I did. I was such a good person. I got here on my own. You get there totally because of Christ. The fact that time is short calls for us to do something about it now because the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the accepted time, not tomorrow, today. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. You can harden your heart. You hear a message like this and it can be very dangerous because you'll harden your heart. And the next time you hear the gospel, your heart will be harder and harder and harder. Come to Christ now. If there's even a whisper in your heart that you need to come, you come and say, Lord, you have all of me tonight. I want to be sure that I'm ready to meet you. Come now. Come now. If you'd like to receive Christ, then you can pray a prayer like I did. Or like I did. Like I did. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. And I want to turn from my sins. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died for my sin and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as Lord. From this day forward, Jesus, I put my trust in you. And I surrender my life to you. And I surrender my life to you. I surrender my life to you. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.